Oh, hi. Good evening. I'm uh, uh, Bradley Graham, the co-owner of uh, Politics and Prose, al along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and on behalf of the uh, entire staff, thank you so much for coming and, uh, and welcome. Um, now, for this evening, we have a very fun topic, uh, ping pong, or rather ping pong diplomacy, which is the title of Nick Griffin's new book. Uh, the title, in fact, can, conveys, well, not just the substance, but the spirit of the book. It's written with a lot of zest and quirkiness, much like the game of ping pong. Uh, and much like good diplomacy, it also pays close attention to relevant personalities and the geopolitical context. In this case, the at times rather offbeat, colorful personalities and Cold War political machinations that surrounded ping pong during the 20th century, culminating in the events of 1971 when an American team visited China to participate in a table tennis competition. Nick is an experienced journalist who has covered a wide range of topics for a number of publications, and he's an accomplished author with four novels and one work of nonfiction before this latest one. On his website, he reveals a certain puckish streak by summing up his life this way. Quote, I was born in London, left when I was 18, spent the next 20 years in New York, and moved to Miami in the summer of 2013. Why move to Miami in the summer? Because if you can stand Florida heat in July, then the temperature of hell will come as a pleasant surprise. <laughs> he adds that he has an English father, an American mother, a Venezuelan wife, a surfing son, a skateboarding daughter, and a dog from New Jersey. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Nicholas Griffin. I think you all know me very well now. But, uh, so I'm here tonight to talk about ping pong diplomacy. And in a nutshell, it's this extraordinary spring of 1971 when after 22 years of silence, uh, there's this sudden U-turn in relations between China and the United States. And that face-to-face -face moment doesn't happen between politicians. It happens between ping pong players. And the way it's generally been presented in, in the States is it's this sort of wonderful, spontaneous moment uh, of this brotherhood of two sportsmen who meet at the back of a bus, and they plant this seed that quickly uh, germinates into, into this huge foreign policy change. And this all happens in, in around five or six weeks. Uh, this book makes the case that that's utter rot, that uh, this was the, l most, the least spontaneous thing that had ever happened. Uh, in American foreign policy history, and I make the case that actually it goes, it can be traced back roughly 60 years, because ping pong, uh, as I'm going to hopefully prove tonight, was probably the only sport that was truly born politic as a, as a piece of politics. So I want to start by asking you to conjure up three very different images in your head. Uh, the first image is this. Imagine a future communist revolutionary but he's only four or five. Uh, and he's wearing a black velvet suit, and he's wearing silk stockings, and he's wearing a silk shirt with ruffles, uh, and he's wearing patent leather shoes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and he's wearing patent leather shoes, and he's sitting there, but he can't quite break away because he has a nanny who's combing his hair. <laughs> but he really wants to get to the window because guess who's coming to tea? the Princess of Wales. Now, he's very excited about this because he knows that the Princess of Wales is going to arrive in a golden carriage and there are going to be a dozen white horses, and this is the best moment uh, that any little boy could wish for. So finally he breaks away and he gallops down, down the stairs of this enormous mansion straight smack in the middle of Kensington in London, and he goes into the drawing room where, where his mother and father are, and the door opens, and this sort of rather drab lady in a brown dress comes in, and she sits down. They have tea. She stands up an hour later. She leaves, and he's like, but mother, mother, where, when's the princess arriving? And, of course, the mother goes, that, that was the princess. And there's this huge disappointment for him. And he actually turns out to be a bit of a t disappointment to the Princess of Wales as well because she's going to write a letter 20 years in the future to his mother that's actually a condolence letter, even though nobody's actually died. Uh, because he's 
committed a terrible sin in in England in 1928. Uh, he's gone and married not one, but two social classes beneath himself. And this is actually headline news. It's not only headline news across England, it's headline news in the New York Times. Baron's son weds secretary. So let me jump now. The second image I'd like you to remember tonight is that there are two Chinese men standing in the middle of a cave, and between them is a ping pong table. And they're playing ping pong, and one has a slightly withered arm. Uh, he's fallen off a horse the previous year, and his doctor's orders that if he wants to keep it stretched out, the best exercise he could possibly do is to play ping pong. So he's playing, and the oddest thing about this scene is that there's an aerial bombardment going on. Uh, so the cave is shaking, but this is how they pass the time, these two men. They're playing ping pong. Let's jump again. Last one to remember. Uh, it's 1971. There's an American hippie. He is sneaking out from his hotel at four in the morning with a friend. They're running through the streets. A crowd starts to follow them because he's the only American hippie in the entire of China. He sees this bunch of bicycles there and he thinks, well, if this is a communistic society, I guess I can just take one. And as he goes to take one, he realizes that the crowd really don't like this. So he's just about to get on it and his friend goes, I don't know if we should do this. And he sees someone pick up a rock and he realizes this is not a good idea. They drop the bikes and they sprint back to the hotel as quickly as they can. Now what I've just suggested to you there, this is really the beginning, the middle and end of this book. These, these people are actually connected, strangely enough. And the first person who I told you about, the future communist revolutionary, is, is a man called the Honorable Ivor Montague. Uh, the two Chinese men playing ping pong in the cave are Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, uh, who in 10 years from that moment will, will run all of China. And the American hippie is a young man called Glenn Cowan, uh, who one week is in California, the next week he's called up as a reserve player to head to the World Championships in Japan, and two days later he's standing in the middle of Beijing as the world's most spontaneous diplomat. Now one thing I think is important to ask when you set out to write any book or when you set out to read any book is, you know, why is this relevant? And I just want to talk about why I think it's still relevant today. You know, we, we're all aware that China's very much you know, been on this, this long, slow rise. And we're also aware that even very recently, last week, it's still, it's very much in the news. We have, we have things happening in the East China Seas, South China Seas. We have the issue of Japan, islands, airspace. Uh, Japanese are placing huge orders for drones. The Chinese are building aircraft carriers. I mean, this is, we're very much linked to China, uh, not just because they're holding $1.25 trillion of our debt, but because we have defense treaties with, with, with many of their neighbors. But the thing to remember is that this is also the only country in the world which has a template for empire. Uh, they've been there and done that before. Uh, this was the richest country in the world till, till the 1800s. Uh, it's very hard to imagine Greece making a comeback anytime soon, or you know, ancient Rome turning the corner uh, or even England. I mean, England is, you know, that's where I grew up, and I think there's a reason why we're all obsessed by Downton Abbey and Harry Potter, because it feels like yesterday. It feels like a time when, you know, we were actually doing things in the world. Uh, but here we have China rising again. To them, this last 180 years are sort of a bit of a blip, but they have a very long history, and it's, you know, 180 years for us is, is an enormous piece of history. Uh, for them, it's, it's a small amount of time. Now, what are the intentions of China? Well, nobody really knows. Uh, the best description I've ever heard uh, was of two tiles and some putty. And if you pushed the putty together between the two tiles, what we know about China are the little bits of putty that stick out of the edges. Uh, and I think that's a, a very good thing to keep in mind. But I thought to myself, if, if this relationship is now so key, why don't I have a very close look at the start of it. I mean, Kissinger called it the most important breakthrough since World War II, and then he got a bit carried away and called it the most important breakthrough since the American Civil War, mostly because Kissinger was in the middle of it. Uh, but I thought, 
this was called ping pong diplomacy for a reason. And I thought, well, how about the ping pong part of ping pong diplomacy? Did it mean anything? And this idea occurred to me when I was in Beijing uh, for the Olympics in 2008. And I had the idea to go and see the, a game of ping pong because I actually back then I thought Chinese uh, ping pong was Chinese. Uh, and when you go in, the very first thing, if you're a journalist, you get a sort of big bump of, of papers with all these facts on them in case you want to use them in your reports. And the first fact was 300 million Chinese play ping pong at least once a week. And if you know anything about China, uh, the most obvious thing is that it's a top-down country, not a bottom-up country. So it occurred to me, gosh, how bizarre. That means someone gave the order for everybody to go out and play ping pong. I mean, how strange. And then as I watched the game, it started to make a bit more sense because I could see that this was a very good way to win a gold medal. This was, had a lot of nationalism in it. But sports, of course, are an acceptable face of nationalism. And I thought, well, I remember ping pong diplomacy 40 years ago. I wonder if there's a connection. So I asked uh, a Chinese friend and I said, what do you know about the history of ping pong? And he said, well, you're born in England. Don't you know that this all goes back to a man called Ivor Montague? This is the boy in velvet who's going to have tea with the Princess of Wales. And I thought I'd never heard of Ivor Montague. Uh, but not only had I heard, had my father heard of Ivor Montague, but uh, my father had, had, he had been his, room, his nephew's roommate at college. So this was very close. And I'd actually shared every Christmas of my life till I was 20 with the Montague family, none of whom had been allowed to meet Uncle Ivor which of course made things even more interesting. So now I knew there was something to hide. Who on earth was this man that the Chinese knew so well, but I had never heard of? So I started digging and I found out a few fascinating things. One, this was, this was one of the very wealthiest families in England at the turn of the century, immense wealth, uh, and highly, highly connected. Uh, cousins and, and family members at the highest ranks of British politics, home secretaries. Uh, king and queen coming over for dinner, never a bad thing. Uh, remarkably connected. Now, Ivor, when he was 13, uh, was attracted to socialism and forms two important friendships, one with H.G. Wells and one with George Bernard Shaw, who both take him under uh, their wings. But by the t he, he hardens in a way that they don't and becomes a full-blown communist by the time he's 18. But he also needs, he wants to prove that he can work. So he goes out and he gets involved in the film industry. And one of the first people uh, he comes into contact with is a young director about to cut his first film called Alfred Hitchcock. So he then uh, produces uh, five of Hitchcock's movies for him. They're all spy movies. And what Hitchcock doesn't know is that just when he's about to shoot that first movie, Montague takes a trip to Moscow. While he's in Moscow, he gets picked up by the Russian intelligence services. And he's sent back, and from that moment, he's a member of the Comintern, which is the Communist International, which has a mandate of uh, sending communistic ideas into other countries through culture. And that culture can be anything. It can be journalism, it can be film, and it can be sport. Now, at exactly that same time, when he's 21, he sits down and he founds something called the International Table Tennis Federation. He thought this is one more way where he can really be useful t to the Soviets. Uh, it's, it's quite a bizarre idea. He tries to pitch it to the Soviets very seriously and they don't pay much attention to him. But it does spread very quickly. Ping pong at that point is a very popular sport. When he has the first world championships in London, 10,000 people pay up and pay for tickets. I mean, it's quite hard to comprehend that here now when even the national championships here get a couple of 100. Uh, so he goes on spying, and he does one remarkable thing, which he graduates from the Comintern, and in World War II, uh, they recruit him. Well, he's already mostly recruited, but he switches over to the even more impressive GRU, uh, who is sort of the intelligence network for, for sort of Soviet military uh, and foreign services. So... He's now spying at a much higher level for something called the X Group. His brother doesn't know that, but his brother is uh, the head in naval intelligence officer for the Double X Group in England. So it's a very strange situation. Double X, of course, is a British joke, double cross. And he's running agents. He's, he's, his brother's in charge of finding German agents and, and sending them back to Germany as double agents. 
So there's this very strange, we're not quite sure what uh, level of communication was happening between the two brothers, but it's, it's, uh, it's fairly intricate. So after World War II, Montague has this wonderful opportunity. It's 1949, uh, China falls to the communists, and he sees a, this chance. So within two weeks of Mao taking the helm in China, uh, Montague writes and offers them a place in the International Table Tennis Federation. He doesn't know that he's actually dealing with two very keen table tennis players in Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai. And they, of course, have been informed that Montague is very friendly to the communist cause. There's no other international sporting body in the world run by a communist. This is a wonderful thing. Uh, so he manages to get his way out to China uh, the following year, and they set up table tennis, and very soon it officially becomes the national sport of China. And to show just how importantly it was being taken, uh, the squad is run by a man called Ho Long, whose previous job was leading quarter of a million troops in battle in the Chinese Civil War. So it's a bit of a leap for him. Uh, and he builds it very well and takes it very seriously. And by the end of the 1950s, China wins its first ever gold medal. And it's a big celebration. It's in table tennis at the World Championships. But of course, at the end of the 1950s, something else is happening. It's the time of the Great Leap Forward, which as they're realizing right as 1960 hits, well, even before that, it's not great and it's not going forward. It's actually a full-fledged disaster. And one of the people uh, who's responsible for that was a Soviet agrarian scientist who came up with this wonderful idea of close planting seeds. Uh, this was science based on ideology, which is never a particularly good thing, but he thought that if you poured a pile of seeds into a small piece of land. Seeds are like good communists. They help one another out, uh, and you'll get even more, uh, a much larger harvest from a much smaller plot of land. Of course, that's not what happened. Seeds, seeds fight uh, for light and for water. It was a disaster. Collectivization's going on. So by the time Montague arrives for the ping pong championships, which he's going to give to China, in 1961, somewhere between 17, if you believe the Chinese statistics, and 44 million people, if you believe the latest book by Frank Dakota, are dead in China. I mean, it's quite an extraordinary number. I live in Miami now, and I figured out that that means that if I set out from Miami and tried to walk to Washington, D.C., I wouldn't actually see anyone alive until I hit the border of Virginia. Uh, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary number. But Montague brings this ray of hope. He's going to offer them the world championships of ping pong, and Zhou Enlai decides that this is an opportunity to show that China is just fine, that there is no famine. So they use it as a real propaganda uh, point. They get in foreign players, they get in foreign coaches and officials, and they bring in foreign journalists. And Montague's allowed to handpick the foreign journalists, and of course he does this then there are certain rules. Now, rule number one, they're not allowed to speak a word of Mandarin. Uh, they're all given minders. They're marched around. And extraordinarily, even though they're in, in China for two weeks, no one knows a thing. It, the secret is kept. Uh, in retrospect, I, talk, I tracked down a lot of the players who had been in China in 61 in the middle of this, in this famine. And in retrospect, they'd figured out tiny things, like one had five come back to try and eat his sandwich after he left it on a table and the sandwich was gone or waiters reacting with looks of horror when someone asks for half an orange or things like that, you know, just, but just tiny, tiny things. No one, no one clicked. Uh, but one of the things that had happened was if you're going to do that and use that as, and show that you're a healthy nation because you're hosting a ping pong tournament, that's not enough. You actually have to win the ping pong tournament. So there's an immense amount of pressure on these players and some cracked mentally and were kicked out of the team. Uh, but the rest succeed. And Montague does his bit and bends the rules here and there. But the Chinese are a cut above the rest by now. Even the Japanese, who are their great enemies, not just for the last 100 years, but also in ping pong. Uh, and at the end of that, ping pong spreads through China like never before. And millions of people begin to play it. And these men and women who've won the medals in 1961 are now the second most famous group of people in China behind the revolutionary leaders. But they're also allowed to befriend the revolutionary leaders. So when the revolutionary leaders go on holiday, the ping pong squad goes with them. 
When they're dancers, they dance together. Joe and Lye cooks for the ping pong squad. He's rolling dumplings alongside them. Uh, so everything's looking fine until the moment of the Cultural Revolution. Now in the Cultural Revolution, to put it very simply, it's sort of uh, Mao gives the young a chance to practice revolution against people their parents' age, teachers, parents, uh, and leaders. And China's basically split in two, and ping pong is considered to belong to something that was already successful uh, that had been started by the revolutionary leaders. So these men and women go from being the most popular people in China to among the most hated people in China. They're dragged up on stage in front of 10,000 people. They have their heads shaved, they're tortured, uh, they're locked up, some of them for a long time. Many are sent down to the country and made to work in the fields picking wheat by hand, and three are hounded to death, including one who I prove wasn't actually, didn't take their own life, but was beaten to death. And he was the man who had won the very first gold medal in all of modern, in modern Chinese history. Uh, and at the same time, because of the Cultural Revolution, Mao has backed himself into a real corner. I mean, he's pulled all his ambassadors back to China. It's obviously a domestic disaster. No one outside the country really knows what's happening inside the country. And the country's still quaking. So Mao comes up with a very extreme answer to solve both problems. Uh, he's frustrated with the with the civil with with the Cold War. What he wants to do is to create a space for China to triangulate the world rather than just watching the Russians and the Americans divide the world. So he figures the best way to do this is to pick a fight with the Soviet Union, and it starts off with a border skirmish on the on a frozen river in the north where where the Chinese gun down uh, thirty. Uh, Soviet soldiers in an ambush. It very quickly escalates to probably beyond what Mao thought would happen. And uh, within months, there are a million Soviet troops on the border. But Mao being Mao does something even more extraordinary. He decides it's time to set off two nuclear tests uh, around 100 miles from the border, which are going to carry fallout over the Soviet positions. Now, of course, that's not really a message meant for the Soviets. It's actually a message meant for the Americans. So what happens? The Soviets are obviously rather perturbed by this, and they come to Washington, or, and they approach various players, and they ask, would America greenlight some sort of limited nuclear strike on China? Uh, this then launches this incredible building, uh, or rather digging period in China that year, where Zhou Enlai claims that by the end of that year, the entire urban population could be underground within five minutes. Uh, but it's also this extraordinary signal that both Nixon and Kissinger get, that, oh my gosh, this is a chance to change the shape of the world. Uh, we, ne you know, we knew the Russians and the Chinese had had a few falling outs over the year, but we still believe that that monolith of communism was more or less held together. Now it's very obvious that it's not. Uh, and over here, we have, we have something we want as well. We want the end of Vietnam. This is something Nixon's inherited. Uh, if you listen to the Nixon tapes, it is something that's talked about every single day. How do we get out of Vietnam? How can we stop this? And of course, every time they try and approach the Russians to do something about it, the Russians want nothing to do with it. They love, you know, the idea of Vietnam continuing eternally is a, is a wonderful thought for the Kremlin. So you start this slow motion sort of flirting between Mao and Zhou Enlai and Kissinger and Nixon. And they finally find a channel to communicate in, and that's the Pakistanis. And they start sending handwritten notes, and they go through diplomatic pouches, and it's all taking a very long time, but it is, it's, it's a real breakthrough. And things are looking pretty positive in, in 1970, until the Chinese uh, decide to give the Americans a really obvious signal that things are going great, and we totally miss it. Uh, it was obvious to Mao, it wasn't obvious to us. It was putting a left-wing American journalist on Mao's right during one of the big parades. Uh, the problem was Kissinger and Nixon didn't trust that journalist. It was Edgar Snow. He was considered so left-wing that he was, you, know, you, you couldn't listen to a word this man said. The problem was Mao and Zhou Enlai, although they liked him very much, always presumed that he'd worked for the CIA. <laughs> so you then get this fantastic opportunity and boom, 
suddenly they fall back into silence again and no one really knows whose turn it is. And hence the ping pong move. The idea for Zhou Enlai is to make a move so blindingly obvious that it's not only going to be obvious to the White House, it's going to be obvious to every single press organization in America, and as it turns out, to every single press organization in the world. There's one problem, though. The next world, ch champion ch the next world championships happen to be in Japan, and China doesn't even have diplomatic relations with Japan. So Zhou Enlai has to start these extraordinary detailed maneuvers to make this approach that's going to happen in just two or three months work. So he flies in the head of the Japanese Table Tennis Association, manages to convince him to throw his career down the drain and invite the Chinese. Uh, he is, of course, fired immediately after the World Championships. Uh, he then has to convince his own team to go to China, I mean, to go to Japan. Now, they've just been taught uh, since 1966 that any interaction with foreigners has in many cases been punishable by death. Now they're supposed to just raise their hands in the air and, and fly to China. And who knows who they could possibly meet in China. In the end they have a vote and they pretty much all say no thank you very much. And then they're told that actually it's not much of a choice. Mao has said they're going to go. Uh, so Zhou Enlai's involvement is so detailed, he even picks the pilot who's going to send them over, and he sends them in two teams in case one plane is shot down or bombed. And Mao has a very comforting last words to them, which is, uh, things might not go as planned. We may lose a few of you, but good <laughs> luck, more or less. Uh, so the team arrive, and they they do what the Chinese always did in these championships. They've brought, they're basically, it's like a moving embassy. Everyone else sort of mingles in the vague spirit of, of ping pong and brotherhood. The Chinese arrive, they had their own bus, they had their own hotel, they had their own training ground, and they even had their own chefs who come with them. Uh, but this time, there's this day when Glenn Cowan, the American hippie who we talked about at the beginning, walks out of a training session and just stumbles onto this bus, the door closes, and there he is surrounded by 24 Chinese communists. But of course, that's not what happened. Glenn Cowan was actually waved onto the bus. Uh, it, he said it, no one really seemed to hear him, uh, and then something even more peculiar happens. The best ping pong player in the world gets up from the back of the bus and comes forward carrying a proper gift. Now, Chinese gift giving was very, very regulated. Ping pong players gave ping pong players pins. That's it. But back in Beijing, there's a warehouse where if you're going on any kind of diplomatic trip, you go and you choose the exact level of gift that you're going to give to the exact level of person you're going to go and meet. And one of the players, the main player, slipped up a few years later and, and confessed that he spent a long time choosing the present because it was going to be for an American. Uh, it was a silkscreen portrait, not a, not a pin. Uh, the press are waiting when that bus stopped. Uh, the pictures hit the papers. And within 36 hours, a group of Americans land in China for the first time in 22 years. Nixon and Kissinger are surprised, of course. Kissinger is actually horrified because he's still hoping to get the Pakistani channel revived. And who knows who these people are? And he was right. He didn't have any idea who these people were, and neither did the State Department. Who knew, for instance, that one of those players, who you could probably guess, is carrying a bag of drugs on him? Uh, another player lands and within 24 hours declares Mao to be the greatest single living human being on the planet. Uh, but they're in this extraordinary, extraordinary situation. Uh, and not only that, the entire world is watching. This becomes front page news within 24 hours. Before they'd left, one player had the gall to call the New York Times before they'd left for Japan and suggested that he could cover uh, the world championships in Nagoya free for the New York Times. And he had actually been laughed at down the phone. Now he's about to enter into China and the New York Times keep calling him going, please, please, please write for us while you're there. Uh, But what, what this does, though, within a week, is something absolutely remarkable. To me, it's this moment of genius from a country 
that's really a, still a very long way from a position of strength, China. It's going to hold, ping pong diplomacy will hold the attention of the world for an entire month. But in that month, something vital happens. If you would have asked all public opinion polls before ping pong diplomacy show that there's no support or limited support for China entering the UN, within a month, it's a majority for the first time. China is now welcome. What ping pong diplomacy has done is humanize the Chinese. Now, it's fascinating because in ping pong to the Chinese was a way to let them show their friendliness while still being in absolute control because they're the best team in the world. Ping pong to your average American is a recreational game played in basements of fraternity houses. So it works on this double level. Uh, to us, it's a benign game. So suddenly, the Chinese were much more benign. And this gives an enormous amount of political leeway to both Mao and Nixon. I mean, imagine Nixon trying to do this the year before without ping pong. Uh, he had a re-election campaign to think of, and could he have forced this through the Republican right? I doubt it very much. And Mao, could he have done this without ping pong? He had his own problems in the Cultural Revolution. He had the, he had the Gang of Four and the radicals who, who much preferred the idea of warming up to the Soviet Union again. So I think as a manipulator extraordinaire, I would give Zhou Enlai the real lion's share of credit for ping pong diplomacy. The Soviets were bamboozled by this moment. One of the most fun times I had doing this research was reading through uh, all the uh, traffic of Soviet ambassadors around the world in this week of ping pong diplomacy. They all request meetings with their American counterparts around the world, and they all repeat the same line, which is, do not trust the Chinese. You cannot trust the Chinese. Don't believe a word they're saying. And, you know, as Kissinger sits there reading these things, this is music to his ears. This is extraordinary opportunity. And I'd like to end with saying one thing, which is taking it back to, to Ivor Montague for a second. This is a very ironic moment for him. I mean, he's still alive. And what he's got are the two great loves of his life, ping pong and the Soviet Union. But here he is having entrusted the Chinese with his game that he's bent slowly towards the communist cause over decades. And yet the Chinese have taken it, honed it to an extraordinary level, deployed it as a diplomatic tool, and then used it to undermine the Soviet Union and to bring them to a bargaining table with two countries in a much warmer, warmer sense. Thank you very much. You're the perfect person to pass on this question <laughs> in light of um, ping pong diplomacy with a country that we had no connection with, Dennis Rodman's recent trip to North <laughs> Korea, <laughs> and basketball diplomacy. Any thoughts on that? Yes, yes. No, uh, uh, I think, uh, I mean, Rodman has said it himself. This is basketball diplomacy. It's based on ping pong diplomacy. Uh, I think it's a long, he, I th he's way out on the limb here and, and there's so little in common. I mean, I, I actually feel, I felt rather bad for him. Uh, ping pong diplomacy could not have happened without the political framework that pre-existed it. It was all about political goodwill. It was conducted in secret, so it was very hard to know I mean, the ping pong players had just dropped into this thing with no knowledge whatsoever. Uh, but the political goodwill that preceded it was so strong, even though they're carrying drugs and, you know, supporting Mao and, and you know, plenty of strange things happening, there's no way anything's going to go wrong. It's, uh, you know, the Chinese aren't going to let anything go wrong. And, and Nixon and Kissinger are ultimately thrilled by this. I mean, Kissinger, Nixon's question the whole week long during ping pong diplomacy, anyone who enters the Oval Office, you'll hear it on the tapes, goes, have you learned to play ping pong yet? Have you, <laughs> have you learned? I mean, he's very excited by this. He gets it immediately. Uh, now, unless there's something secret going on right now between Kim Jong-un and Obama and they're sort of Skyping at midnight as they watch Houston Rockets and Utah Jazz games, I really don't think there's that. I mean, the other thing that's vital to remember is that there were a lot of other signals sent by the Chinese in 1970 and 71 to assure the Americans that things were going to move forward. And one of them was, was a similar situation in a way. There was a dying priest who, who had been held captive by the Chinese for many years. 
uh, and they decided to release him uh, just before ping pong diplomacy. It was another very obvious gesture. Now there's Kenneth Bay. It's very low hanging fruit. Uh, it would be a very easy thing to do if you were serious about about a true warming relationship. Obviously, it hasn't been done. I mean, the only real message we've had is is that he gunned down his ex girlfriend and executed his uncle, and that's not really happy Christmas. So, I think he's way off base. Way off base. Yeah. Uh, how do the games turn out between the Chinese and the <laughs> Americans? Uh, they were, well, one, the most extraordinary thing about the games, which all the American players remember very well, is that they walk into the stadium. I mean, no, no one's ever really had more than a thousand people watch them before if they're lucky. And the stadium is packed to the rafters. There are 19, 20,000 people there, except the Chinese aren't taking any risks. They're all members of the People's Liberation Army. <laughs> and not to clap. I mean, it's a very bizarre, but I mean, Joe and Lai is so involved, he's even written the script that's read out uh, throughout, the, throughout the games. And they're all managed, and I think the Chinese win the men's 5-3, and they win the women's 5-4. And Glenn Cowan finally realizes that uh, the games are being thrown. It takes them a while, because one thing the Chinese, they've been using ping pong diplomatically throughout the 60s with many countries, and they've learned how to throw a game really, really well. For instance, they wanted relations, uh, good relations with Ghana, and the Ghanese defense minister happened to be the head of the Ghanese Table Tennis Association. So the, guess what? They lost a the game to him. Uh, but they know how to do it beautifully. And Cowan finally figures this out, and he says, he screams some expletives uh, in, in, the middle, in the middle of this, of this tournament. But of course, no, that's not translated. Uh, peace is kept. But it's a fantastically bizarre situation no one you know none of them have ever seen anything like this before you mentioned that the uh, tennis players the americans almost materialized overnight i guess the question is how do they get there so quickly who facilitated it who paid for it no great question and uh was it cowan or how did that happen no it happened because well the first thing that happened was once they had the invitation they did what you would think they would do they rang the 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 embassy in tokyo now there was a very quick thinking uh, China watcher on the phone that day called Bill Cunningham, who's a wonderful, wonderful man who walked me through this very slowly so that I got it. Uh, and he had this extraordinarily difficult decision to make because, you know, he, had, he hadn't heard a peep from the White House or the State Department for the simple reason they didn't know. And here comes this invitation. What should he do? Should he say yes and let them go to China? Or should he say no? And what if it's meant politically and this is actually welcome, then, then would this be an opportunity lost? So he remembers, uh, there was a very chunky report published that January, and he remembers a single line inside it, and he rummages through his desk, and he finds out that, that a new line has been slipped in, saying that athletic, change, uh, athletic meetings uh, would be allowed. So all he says is like, well, athletic meetings are allowed, and, and, and the head of the American Ping Pong Association goes, does that mean I can go? And he's like, well, I'm not telling you that. You know, I'm not saying yes, but he's like, but you're not saying no. He's like, you're an individual. You're an American. You can do it if you want to, but I'm certainly not saying no. And he's, he's really guessing uh, that they're going to be allowed to go. Now, all the players are amateurs. N n very few of them uh, have any money whatsoever. And, you know, 1971, to change a plane ticket was a very expensive business. Don't worry, say the Chinese. We will pay for everything. The head coordinator there who's running the Chinese table tennis team is a man called Sung Zhong. And he's, well, everyone thinks he's a table tennis official, which he is. But before that, he was a military stra strategist in the PLA for many, many years. Uh, he, was, he was on the ball. He knew exactly how to handle this whole situation. And even the invitation he issues, it was never, would you like to come to China? It was, how would you respond if you were to be invited to China? So when, it, when the announcement is made by the Chinese, they say, we are accepting the eager Americans uh, who want to come visit China, would like to have them here. And it's sort of almost framed like an imperial edict. Uh, but they're, they're basically paid for by the Chinese. Yeah. Could I uh, say a, a word or two? <laughs> you certainly can. Uh, uh, my name is Dick Solomon, and I was on uh, Kissinger's staff 
at this time and had the privilege of uh, escorting the Chinese ping pong team around the United States in the spring of uh, 1972. All I can say on behalf of uh, uh, Nick Griffin, his, his book is something what we dearly wish we had had at the time that uh, <laughs> would have given us real background on the politics of, of that period. And one of the things he really uh, dramatizes is the degree to which the politics of the Cultural Revolution had entrapped not, a, not just everybody, including the ping pong players and poor Zhuang Zedong, who I later had the interesting experience of playing ping pong against Winston Lord and some of the others. He was caught, uh, he was leaning towards Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, who was one of the evil eminences of the Cultural Revolution versus more moderate uh, people. So this book really is uh, is very valuable, and it's unfortunate that we didn't have it at the time. And <laughs> let me just give you one or two uh, things from an American point of view that will give you a little flavor. Uh, we were sent, uh, we were constituted as a delegation to accompany the Chinese. I was Kissinger's representative, and I was paired with John Scally. John Scally, as many of you know, was an, uh, I think, ABC News reporter. He was Kissinger's communications director. And as we were beginning this tour, Scali whispered in my ear, you know, the president is really furious that Henry Kissinger is getting all the credit for the opening to China. The secret trip for Kissinger had made him a superstar. And so Scali, during this trip, kept whispering in the ear of the journalists who were following <laughs> us that this was really Nixon's uh, initiative. The Chinese were learning as much about us as we were learning about them. And one of the dramatic early events is uh, we met them at the Detroit airport in early April of 72. We're on a bus, and as the bus left the airport, there was a row of what turned out to be American Maoists raving that, waving that little <laughs> red book of quotations from Lin Biao, which had been used to promote Lin Biao's position. What the Chinese, what the Americans didn't know is that Lin Biao was a non-person. He, he had apparently tried to uh, have Mao assassinated. He fled to the Soviet Union. The plane crashed. And so the Little Red Book was not to be seen in China. And here were these American Maoists <laughs> waving the Little Red Book at the <laughs> Chinese delegation. Of course, they were really nonplussed. <laughs> there, there were all kinds of... Uh, events that uh, I, I don't shouldn't take the time to give you about how the Chinese were flabbergasted to learn about uh, American society. Among other things, they went to Hollywood. They met uh, Loretta Young. They met, uh, uh, who was the guy who uh, you mentioned they had seen his horror films? Uh, uh, Hitchcock, well, they met Hitchcock, yeah. They wrote it down. They bumped into Hitchcock, which was Alfred a wonderful... Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. Anyway, and at the And Pinocchio they met. The <laughs> in the con uh, the, at the conclusion of the trip, uh, there was a kind of uh, fair summary, summary banquet uh, in San Francisco where the Chinese were asked, well, what did you learn about American society uh, during your uh, three-week tour? of the United States, and uh, uh, the punchline was one uh, chi of the Chinese uh, delegation got up and said, well, from my talks with uh, many Americans, I've learned that Nixon sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, his uh, language uh, and his politics were not, not, not yeah. quite right. Uh, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, President Nixon, from his point of view, never got the credit that uh, in many circles he, uh, he deserved for this opening. But I certainly urge you to read Nick's book. I think it's really t terrific. It is beautifully written. And as I said, it's uh, a background to one of the, of course, most interesting elements in uh, American foreign <coughs> policy. That's very kind. Thank you. Thank you.
Just wanted to mention, I went to BCC here and in graduated in 1972, and the ping pong team came to Bethesda Chevy Chase School That's here. Right. And I pulled the paddle, uh, the face off a paddle and flipped it over and had all the Chinese sign. Do you, you still have it? Huh? You still have it? I wish. I don't know. No. <laughs> you know how mothers are. <laughs> 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 I haven't had a chance to read your epilogue, but it seems like one constant that has remained in the 40-some years since is Chinese distrust and disdain for Russia, particularly that, that Gorbachev screwed up communism. Uh, whereas with the Americans, I think, and tell, I'd like your view on this, well, we were useful at the time and now we're sort of getting in their way. Yeah. No, I think, well, one of the most extraordinary quotes I ever read from Mao was, was you know, what he asks, he, he tells his doctor a riddle one night, and he goes, what do you do when, when you're surrounded by enemies? And, you know, we have India over on one border, and we attack them, and they hate us. We have the Taiwanese, they hate us. We have the Japanese, they hate us. Uh, we have the Russians, and they hate us. Uh, you know, what do you do? And, and he goes, you, you have to reach across the oceans, was the answer. Uh, as our forefathers did. Uh, hang on, there was a point to that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm afraid I've gotten lost it. Oh, yes, he says something remarkable. He goes, I want to deal with Nixon. And the doctor's shocked because he thought, if anything, he'd wait, uh, might wait and see if he could deal with a Democrat. And he goes, no, 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 no. I like rightists. Rightists always say exactly what they mean, uh, which is a... And I think there's a lot of that, that, that they see in America a lot of practicality, uh, not just from rightists, but from centrists as well. Uh, and they never, they never got a, sh a fair shake from the Russians. I think they were horrified when, when Stalin came in and was equally punitive as, uh, with his treaties as any czar had been beforehand. I mean, it was a real shock. And I think the other thing to remember from a personal note from Mao's point of view is that Stalin had always promised him air support uh, during the Korean War, and he never got it, and Mao lost his son uh, in a bombing raid. So, I, and Stalin used to call Mao a margarine Marxist, which I think really, really upset him as well. <laughs> so. If I may pose an alternative history question, <laughs> um, I think you do adequately make the case that Zhou Enlai was trying to work behind the scenes to manipulate that invitation to Glenn Cowan. Now, say that. Bill Cunningham received that phone call, and if he'd said no, how do you think that Joe and I would have reacted to that, and how much would that have delayed U.S.-China relations? Uh, it's a good question. I think the answer is that, that the political goodwill was so strong that it was going to happen. Uh, with or without ping pong, this thing would have happened. I wish one day I would love to know. I'm sure there's plan A, B, C, D, E, and I'm sure they got more and more obvious and preposterous. Uh, you know, th this whole trip had no limits to how outrageous and absurd it became. Uh, we, we, got, we, we got a sniff of that. My favorite moment of the 1972 tour, which, get, which gets, is they've, you know, these people have been in the Cultural Revolution. They've lost their friends. They've been picking wheat with their hands. And suddenly they're playing, they go to Marineland in California, and they're playing ping pong with a dolphin. <laughs> I mean, that's, it gets really bizarre. There are lots of ways to suggest happy, friendly that's one of them. I, I, I wish I knew the answer. I would love to know it as well. Uh, one day we will find out. Thank you. So Nick, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to um, wanted to mention that before the, the uh, program began, you were telling me that one of the most interesting experiences you've had since the book has come out has been this uh, interview with the Chinese media and the sorts of, the sorts right. of, 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 of questions that they were asking. And I wonder if you could sh yeah. share that experience with everybody. Sure, sure. Uh, we don't know yet. I've been told, I've been invited to come and speak in China in March, and in order for that to happen, my book had to be vetted, and I've been told my book is neither pro nor anti the Communist Party in China. So I'm in a gray area right now. Uh, the fascinating thing was, in order for me to even conduct all the interviews I did uh, with officials and players in sort of from 1961 through, through the 70s, I had to get permission uh, from the Communist Party to do that, and it took a took a long time, but in the end I got it. And once, once I got it, uh, I was really allowed to interview everyone. Uh, so I was a bit surprised when I got this emailed interview the other day, which was, 
it, it wasn't hugely aggressive, but it was more aggressive than I was expecting. You know, it was saying, where did you get this piece of information? Where did you get that piece of information? You know, in the books, you know, as my publishers make me do, it's thoroughly footnoted, trust me. Uh, and then one question was, you accuse the Chinese of, of sort of this version of, of ping pong spies. How do we know that Glenn Cowan wasn't secretly working for the State Department or the CIA? Uh, well, because he was so high, he could barely move. Is the <laughs> is the uh, is the answer? But you would not, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have trusted him. So I mean, I I wrote a more polite version of that. But I don't I don't I know if it's printed yet. But I'm looking f I'm looking forward. We'll see. But thank you so much for having me. I really. Thank you. <laughs>